but Jeremy Gardner, how he made millions in Bitcoin, crypto. He's only 25 years old and he's one of the most well-known names in Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain. I'm also giving away cash so you can buy some crypto. Oops, we just lost our cover. And I'm gonna give away an iPad mini. So let's do the official opening. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Crypto Mentor Mastermind. I'm bringing in the smartest people in the world on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain. They're mentoring me and I'm sharing it with you. I'm a relative newbie to the space and whenever I wanna learn something, I bring in geniuses. So today, thanks for being here. My pleasure. We got Jeremy Gardner, he's 25 years old. We're talking about how he made millions, how he got in before most people. He didn't just catch the trend and you know ride the trend that other people built. He's been in uh, a, a big part of this whole movement. And he launched a company called Augur, which now market cap, and the uh, if you look on, you know, the coin market caps is three or 400 million. Uh, three or 400 million, right? So I, yeah. don't, I don't check. <laughs> he doesn't even check. He's a, he was a founder, a uh, partner, I should say, at Blockchain Capital with Brock Pierce, who was in the first episode. So uh, he's, he was the entrepreneur in residence He's started a um, very well-known, uh, it's a nonprofit education for training people in colleges around the world. What's the deal size, you as a venture capital, or I would say a crypto venture capital person, you said the companies are at what total value that you've been a part of? So, so, so well, just the companies coming out of the educational nonprofit I started are worth over $11 billion in total. Yeah, so we're gonna be talking about very important things for those of you wanting to learn at the cutting edge from the best, I'm bringing you the best. And thanks for being here. I know, you, how many interviews you do this week? 10? Uh, I think a dozen at this point, and I'm not done. I've got a few more tomorrow. I've <laughs> already done four today. He said his egos might be getting too big. I'm uh, just telling the life story constantly. Because yeah, let's, it, talk, let's, let's talk the life story. Uh, you know, it, 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 I, was a re I had a real rough and tumble adolescence, got in a lot of trouble, arrested, thrown out of schools, did not really have a very promising future. Uh, I knew from a young age, however, that I wanted to make the world a better place. That was like a driving force in my life. And so beginning in, as a teenager and into my early 20s, being from a small farm town in Western Massachusetts, I thought the way you changed the world and made it better was through politics. Okay. Uh, Boy. That, th that was wrong. <laughs> that was wrong. And, and I learned that uh, in the uh, summer after my sophomore year of college, I worked for the governor of Massachusetts. And then I actually ended up leaving the school I was at and working on the campaign of the woman who's now attorney general of Massachusetts. Okay. And I became s incredibly disillusioned with the role of money in politics and the inefficiency of government bureaucracy. And so for the next few months of my life, I, I kind of was at a loss with what I do. And I had first seen Bitcoin in 2011. It was in oh, wow, that was early. Yeah, super early. It was in Rolling Stone. I read about the Silk Road, this like black market, Amazon.com. I thought, I thought the, the, the Silk Road component was interesting, but Bitcoin just seemed stupid and hard to use. Uh, and I kind of forgot about it for a couple of years, and Bitcoin was like maybe 8 or $9 there. And then in 2013, I was working on this woman's campaign for attorney general, and my friends were like, Bitcoin's going to $1,000. I was like, this is crazy, and I looked at the charts, and the, the, the buy side demand was just much greater than the sell side demand. Okay. And so I ended up uh, buying Bitcoin, and it was around $200. And then in the next month and a half, it went to over 1000 So you got in at, what, what was the very first price you got in? It was 200 200 bucks. But then I sold. I was like, this is a crazy pump and dump. This is a scam. This is a bubble. I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. And then sure enough, over the next couple of months after I sold, the price actually declined. And so it kind of vindicated me in the short term. So you were right in the <laughs> you were yeah, right, right in the short term. Right in the short term. Um, and then what happened was, but I didn't, I didn't ever learn about the technology. Uh, but what happened was after growing really disgusted with the world of politics, I transferred to the University of Michigan. And I just happened to move into an apartment that had this kid that was one of the first Bitcoin entrepreneurs living in it. He dropped out of school to start one of the first exchanges in the United States. Which one was it? It was called Bitbox. Okay. And, uh, and he, the company had been defrauded and he moved back to Michigan to kind of rebuild it. But he 
implored me to go and learn about this technology. I was like, it's good for buying drugs off the internet and for speculating. <laughs> That's and, what people still think. Yeah, they exactly. think it's like, of course. this and is I, a silk road. And I, and, I, and I can relate to that. Uh, but he convinced me to actually start learning about the technology, and I didn't know anyone at Michigan, so I had nothing better to do. And he convinced me to join the University of Michigan Bitcoin Club. I was like, what's a what Bitcoin year is this? club? This is now January 2014. Okay. And I meet the head of the Bitcoin club, and at the first meetup, we, we head over early, and a reporter from USA Today shows up, and she mentions that there are Bitcoin clubs at MIT and Stanford, partway through the interview. And I hadn't had much to contribute before then, but from there, the politician in me saw this organizing opportunity. And I ended up reaching out, uh, reaching out to the heads of the MIT and Stanford clubs that same night. They were already planning a call, actually. We got on a call, they were talking about their respective successes and failures as organizations, offering to share resources. And at the end of the call, I say, why don't we create an organization out of these Bitcoin clubs at these universities? And maybe by the end of the semester, we'd have a dozen Bitcoin clubs around the United States. At that time, everyone was like, sure, go ahead. And I just thought it was a resume booster. Right. But then you, I, So you didn't totally see it. I yet. didn't totally see it yet. And I... But I, 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 I kept on learning about Bitcoin and getting more and more ex excited. I, what I realized was that the internet has been this extraordinary conduit for the exchange of information. Yeah. As a result, much of humanity's knowledge has been uploaded to the World Wide Web. However, if you want to exchange value online, yes. you still rely, whether that value is your house, the, 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 your car, you want to sell the rights to your music, or just exchange money, you still rely on the same legacy institutions, such as banks and governments, that have existed yeah. for decades or even centuries. Yeah, the biggest yeah. innovation was like PayPal. Yeah, and, and PayPal that's not, that's and Venmo, still, which yeah. feel instantaneous for consumers, actually is taking days in the back right. end to settle, and it usually goes through paper settlement. It's insane. Yeah. There actually hasn't been a tool that has allowed for the exchange of value that's as frictionless and peer-to-peer -peer like email yeah. until Bitcoin. Yeah. And so, as I began to actually read about Bitcoin, I was like, holy shit, like, this, is, this is Bit. This, this is actually a way for us to not rely on those really just ugly legacy institutions. I had been at Occupy Wall Street in 2011 uh, at Zuccotti Park, uh, you know, marching against the big banks, and nothing had been accomplished. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I saw this tool that allowed you to have a bank account in your pocket. Like, yeah. You didn't need a bank. You, you could be your own bank. And that was a really powerful concept. And, and that got me very excited. And so, the, the, so that got me excited. And then Mt. Gox, the world's largest Bitcoin exchange in the world, imploded. Mm -hmm. Why did it implode? We don't know yet. I'd say it was extreme. There was negligence. There was hacking. There will probably be a good movie made about it. You know, uh, I just had Jordan <laughs> Bell for Wolf of Wall Street here. Is yeah. there, is it going to be a Wolf of Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, for sure. There's a lot of Bitcoin movies that are going to be made. But uh, a half billion dollars of Bitcoin was lost. And at that time, that was more than 5% of all Bitcoin in Where did it go? It's just locked? It's lost? I think it was stolen. Yeah, or, yeah it compromised. <laughs> Not very sure. But fortunately, it brought a huge amount of press attention to Bitcoin. More than it had ever had before. And it drew a lot of young people to the technology. Not for an investment opportunity. Obviously, it was probably not the best investment opportunity at that time. But as a technology, it was very powerful to yeah. a lot of young people. And thus, my nonprofit ended up taking off. Uh, instead of having just a few Bitcoin clubs around the United States by the end of the semester, within three months we had over 100 chapters, wow. 20 plus countries, every habitable continent. Huh. And it was growing, I got a lot of press, and then through my nonprofit, I met a young 18 year old brilliant computer scientist who would go on to become my co-founder of Augur. Of Augur. Yeah. So let's talk about Augur for a second. What do people need to know? What does Augur do? It was an, it was an ICO, right? Yeah, we had an ICO. What year was it? Uh, 2015. So it was one of the first ICOs have gotten first utility bigger now. token ever. Just so you know, ICO, you know, you have IPOs, which is in the old world or the modern world, is an initial public offering. Like Snapchat was an IPO. Um, uh, Snapchat, you know, Apple, all Facebook. that. Facebook. ICO is an initial coin offering. Sure. So it's not an exchange. It's not. It doesn't go on the New York Stock Exchange. It doesn't go on Nasdaq. Uh, and basically, you've created your own token, which right. is called the Augur token, Bitcoin. Rep. Rep. Sorry. Rep. 
and it was utility. The utility was what you did there at Augur. There's security tokens and utility tokens. And then there are protocol tokens like Bitcoin or ETH. Right. And yours is utility. Yes. So yours was the first utility I saw. And, and yeah, it was. And in my view, it's probably one of only five true utility tokens. Right. Some people are trying to pass uh, them as utility. Tokens. And they're really all secure. So what are the five utility, in so, your opinion, that you think are strongly could be argued are full utility? So there's Augur, the prediction market token. Uh, there's Zero uh, X. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a liquidity token for uh, decentralized exchanges. There's Funfair, which is a uh, decentralized casino. Allows you to open state channels, which are kind of like off-chain transactions, and then I actually like Sense, uh, Sensei Crystal Roses, Sense, Crystal, community yeah. uh, currency, where it really makes sense because it's a developer incentivization uh, platform and tool. Uh, and then, ooh, I'd be hard pressed to name a, a, a fifth that I truly love. Uh, yeah. They. It, the, the utility of most of these ICO tokens is just non-existent. And that's why it's potentially the U.S. government is going after them and saying, wait, this is a security token. People are buying these f for the goal of trading them and increasing value. Yeah, yeah, people are investing them in them only with the interest of getting a greater financial return, not actually to use the token. Yes. But I, I actually went on a bit of a rant on Twitter yesterday about this because I think securities security-based tokens are actually a really great idea. Imagine if you create a software platform and every bit of revenue that that software platform generates is early investors get a portion of. Yes. That makes a ton of sense. Yes. And that's like totally straightforward. So instead forward. of Facebook, even Facebook, instead yeah. of Facebook only making Mark Zuckerberg rich yeah. and the, the, the you know, initial co-founders, now it's public, but the most of the money, I mean, you look at Apple, and, mostly owned by Jeff Bezos is the largest. Right, but, but, but imagine if you were an early user of Facebook like I was, and in 2006 you were like, this is a great platform. Yes. I'd love to buy $1,000 worth of shares in, in, in this platform. If I had bought it at the valuation Facebook was worth at 2006, I'd be a multimillionaire from that $1,000 yes. investment alone. And that's the concept behind ICOs. The problem is, is that too many entrepreneurs are trying to force themselves into a box of utility. Because they want to bypass when, security. Yeah, when really they should be yeah. a security. But what we need to do is work with the legislators. We already have the blockchain caucus in Congress. And go work with them to create laws that are more realistic in the age of blockchain technology. Yeah. So we're gonna, I want to come back to your story, but I want to answer. We got we're going live, and I'm seeing different questions, and I want to answer a few of the live questions. We're getting hundreds of questions actually, but somebody said, "Do you think Bitcoin is about to crash?" Look, this is a, uh, a story I love to give these days. Uh, Bitcoin and all crypto assets can be in in a bubble and undervalued at the same time, and I, I'll give you a story to illustrate. Back when. Bitcoin was one or two dollars. I know a gentleman that got really excited about the technology. This was long before I ever heard of Bitcoin. But he was really excited about it and he started to gather money so he could invest. And he wanted to invest like $10,000 when it was one or two dollars. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin went through its first price rally and it went up to 30 bucks. <laughs> and he was like, shit, I have to invest right now. So he invested pretty much all the money he had at $30. Jeez. And then guess what happened? The price crashed down yeah. to $2. And he looked like an idiot. Yeah. To every one of his friends, they're like, you bought into this stupid token bubble, like you're an idiot, it's a Ponzi scheme. And he was like suicidal. I mean, when it goes down that much, like you're just in a state of despair. I mean, it, there, there was no point in even selling because it, it had gone down so much in value. And so he held. And he held until today. Yes. Doesn't look like an idiot. Anymore. He doesn't look. Mark Cuban <laughs> sat in this chair right here and told me, he said, Ty, you only got to get rich once and people forget all your quote unquote. You, you only need to be right once. Yeah. I mean, it's not even being rich. It's just like in life, people remember what you were right about, not what you were wrong yes. about. As long as you are right at least once. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be right at least once. So, so your answer is. Bitcoin, Bitcoin could it go, can go down. It could go down. You should 90, buy more if it goes. I it, hope Bitcoin it, goes exactly, to $2. Exactly. I will $2. I will win. buy everybody's. <laughs> Every single <laughs> coin out there for two dollars right now. No, but like, what? Bitcoin, how many coins are in circulation? Around sixteen or seventeen million. Yeah, of the twenty-one million that will t in total. Be yeah, twenty forty. It caps out, right? No, twenty one forty. Twenty one forty. It gets it, the, the I circulation. It's only hundred years off. off. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. close. But it's only a century look, off. This, this is a point. Bitcoin and crypto assets can go down ninety percent tomorrow, and they'll still be higher than their all-time high less than a year ago. 
Yes. And then assuming that they realize the potential that I believe that they have, they will be worth, the ones that are actually good will be worth exponentially more than they are today. Okay, let's talk, and by the way, I just posted a tweet. If you're not following me on Twitter, tylopez.com slash Twitter. By the way, I've got a foundational class. It's called the Bitcoin Crypto Mastermind. If you go to tylopez.com slash Bitcoin podcast, go to that link. You can get access. It's a paid program. I'm trying to give as much as I can away for free. And then I've got a paid program too for those of you who want to go through a two-month in-depth kind of more dedicated program. Um, so tylopez.com slash Bitcoin podcast. Jeremy. There was a question here on. There's a lot of other there's points a lot of questions. besides Bitcoin, but one of the ones that I like, somebody's talking about Ripple. Let's talk about Ripple. So, oh, Ripple, baby. <laughs> we're going to have a talk on Ripple. So, just so you guys know, the largest coins that you hear about the news talking about is basically Bitcoin and Ethereum. Those are the two biggest market cap. But there's a lot of other ones. There's Bitcoin Cash, and there's Litecoin's been in the news a lot. I want to talk about Ripple, sure. which is has pretty much been holding. It hasn't been like moving. 20 to 25 cents yeah, for like been, nine months. But now it, there's been some changes. Oh, baby. What do you see? What do you think? And then we're going to switch to Litecoin conversation. Okay. Uh, I don't have much to say about Litecoin. But Ripple Ripple's an interesting one because it's one of the only centralized cryptocurrencies, if you will. It's not even a blockchain. It's more like a chain of ledgers. But what it is, is, is it's, a, it's a tool that's being used by banks in theory to help overcome the problem of sending large amounts of money in between it and financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a really strong team, one of the strongest teams in the industry. The technology side of it. The technology and the executive team. And mm -hmm. just, they're really well run. They're run a lot like a bank. Who and, are they? Who are it, it, it's a, a bunch of folks. Uh, uh -huh. one, of, one of the founders was uh, Jed McCaleb, who founded Mt. Gox. He yes. then went on to fork Ripple and turn it into Stellar. But the, the, the Brad, another one yeah, to Brad Garlinghouse was the CEO of AOL, uh, and he's the CEO now. So really, so a strong team. It's a really strong team, and they they've got a niche. They've got banks. Yes. Banks. Do they have any actual clients yet? Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah. Okay. Hundreds. So names that we know. Yeah. yeah. Every major, they've got partnerships with so many major banks, and and all, a lot of them are still trying to implement it. It's not but, like fully implemented. But in but, Japan, though, seventy percent of all consumer bank accounts touch the Ripple network. Yeah. So they, it's actually in deployment, especially in Japan. So it, it's a very real technology. People have questions about the token. I bought the token two years ago or a year and a half ago when I realized the price per token was like 0 .002 cents. And now it's at 30. Yeah, and it was a, no, now it's, no, it's at 85 cents. 85? Yeah, 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 yeah it was yeah. holding at 30. Yeah, I think so last week it was at 30. 25 cents. Yeah, yeah it just yeah. has shot up. It's almost tripled in what the last Yeah, it's now it, like it's, driven, it's driven a lot by sentiment. I could never predict the price of XRP, it, it's very hard to do. But it's one of those things that I've held. I'm probably gonna go rebalance tonight because I think the price has gone up so much. I don't think any- So explain to people, newbies, when you say rebalance, it's sure. very similar, you know, I was in the conventional stock market yeah. and rebalancing is where one of your assets gets inflated in value and you don't want, now it represents a larger portion of your portfolio than you want, so you yeah. wanna sell it. So you will sell potentially. Yeah, it's it's actually the only token I've ever rebalanced, uh, and I consistently do it because it's one of those things where it's a centralized company. There's a lot of dangers in having a centralized company issuing a cryptocurrency, and I think the fact that a a, a startup in San Francisco has that's worth a few billion dollars has its own cryptocurrency that's worth seventy billion dollars. Yes, it's kind of insane. Yes, you know. So so that is so. so I rebalance, I mean, you should do this with any portfolio that you have. You should have a thesis around what you're investing in. Yes. And if you, unless your thesis around the technology you're investing in changes, as opposed to the value of that technology, you should always rebalance. Because yes. that means just other people have realized your thesis, but it should still make up the same percentage of your por portfolio as it did when it was undervalued. Unless something about the technology itself is So changing. Ripple, because it hasn't necessarily, your, your thesis on why it's a valuable, token hasn't changed, but the price has changed, right. you're gonna rebalance it, it down. Exactly. So, and, and just for the, I saw a few questions, people still not completely understanding. Explain maybe in even simpler terms, how the Ripple technology is being used, let's say in banks in Japan. Right, so Ripple has three different components of its technology. The 
XRP, the cryptocurrency, is actually the least used part of right. their tech. But it's the most talked about. It's the most talked about, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But the, the, the Ripple protocol actually just allows for banks to send messages to one another. There's a system called SWIFT that yes. is... Uh, when you do a wire now, it uses you, the it's SWIFT, Swift system. But it's a totally broken system. Yes. And, and Ripple, as a company, is looking to replace that. What its token is looking to do, which is kind of separate than its uh, messaging si system, is allow banks to more frictionlessly send money overseas to one another uh, with, with greater liquidity and speed than they can now. So will the banks be using yes. the tokens? So that's the thesis. Yes. Now, yes. they're not really using it today. Not the thesis it. is if, if, if this can reach a $100 billion or $500 billion market cap, it can actually be an incredible liquidity tool, especially if it has the stability it historically has, except in these run-ups, yes. where, where it actually, actually stays between a very small number between 20 and 25 cents for the past nine months then it could be actually a really cool bank liquidity transfer tool so you if you were going to give a call for yourself at 80 cents you feel like it's a bit high for you it, it's not that it's a bit high i it's mean too I, big too too large of a part of it, your portfolio i think right the now. whole crypto market is is based off of speculative value right yes now. And that, the same goes for XRP. XRP has a really strong company behind it and strong partnerships behind it. And thus it makes sense that it's highly valued. But I can't reasonably say any of the companies, and even I can't even say Bitcoin or Ether are reasonably priced right now because in reality, they're, 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 they're probably not. Uh, but they're based off of future value and thus they could go up exponentially more than, the, than they are right now. And that's why we'll never sell any of these in, in their entirety. You just kind of have to rebalance and decide sometimes when you're going to take cash off the table. Yeah. So now let's switch. Let's go back to your story. Then we'll come back to Litecoin. Sure. And we can talk about Stellar and some things, uh, some of these smaller cryptocurrencies are, are less well-known uh, in mainstream. Crypto people know yeah. about them, but mainstream doesn't. The media hasn't sure. caught on. So going back to your story, um, how did it feel to make a ton of money? Let's talk about money because this is this is complicated for people. Yeah, I mean, so people, because I'm 25 uh, and because I have a, 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 all, all these different things on my resume, people love to talk about how I've made a ton of money. I love to party all over the world. Yeah, because you're, you're, you, you don't mind partying. No, I love partying. I love partying, but... But the money component, as long as I have the money to go travel around the world. Freedom. Yeah, party, uh, adventure, and go invest in technologies I think are going to make the world a better place. That's all I care about. Like, I don't care about cars. I don't care about clothes. I don't own any houses. I don't own any boats. Like, that, that's not what I value. What I invest my money into is almost entirely into startups, into new technologies, into people. Really, I do a lot of philanthropy. And then my money, yeah, I, I mean, my money I spend, you know, on food and drink. That's really it. Uh, the, <laughs> and you have something called the Crypto Mansion. Yeah, the Crypto Castle. To, oh, ca castle, castle, sorry. Got to have a little alliteration, the double C's. I, everything I do, I try to do with alliteration. So, Crypto Castle, how many people live in at this Crypto Castle? Right now, oof, I'm not sure. Uh, may, maybe seven. A, a, seven. It fluctuates, you know. And so it's a big. It's kind of a cross between getting work done and having fun. Yeah, well, it's incredible. I mean, Augur was started there. Comma AI, the self-driving car startup, was founded in my basement. Uh, a, there's a whole trading operation from a couple of former bankers that just quit their jobs to go. Because you're starting your own hedge, you're starting your own crypto hedge fund, right? Correct. Or is it a VC fund? It's a hybrid, uh, hedge hi hybrid VC. venture fund. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's... A veg fund, we'll it's call it. Pretty much, it, it, when I moved to San Francisco in 2014, I, I realized that there were no central social places for, uh, for the people in the blockchain industry. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have a gathering place where people could go hang out. So with the Augur team, when we raised a bit of money, we found this great house in the Petrero Hill neighborhood, three stories, sweeping views of San Francisco and the Bay, and just one big open third floor where people could just come hang out and talk. And I do cri crypto cookouts where we, have, we, where we barbecue and just interesting people can come and talk about this technology and like mesh and, and just explore this technology further. Uh, it's, it's not a huge party place, you know. I throw parties there, but they tend to be fairly intellectual. You go out, I, you party more at clubs. Yeah. I've seen you at clubs. <laughs> uh, we, we were at the Mondrian Sky Bar. You had, yeah. you had uh, we'll leave it at, you had a, 
you had a bit of fun. Yeah, always, always. I mean, I mean, <laughs> what's the point of money if you don't well, enjoy well, it, right? To me, I, I've got an ethos, and it has nothing to do with money. It's this: in order for me to be happy in life, I have to have two things. I have to be working towards changing the world at scale and having fun, and it's a constant rebalancing. Back, back to that term. And right now, because I'm starting this venture, Hedge Fund, I, for 2018, I've set a bunch of goals out for myself. I just published this this in a blog post where I'm gonna totally turn down the parting, really focus it on mindfulness and meditation, and really focus on my work ethos, starting this organization, because now I'm responsible for 50 to $75 million of yeah. other people's money, yeah. and so I have to be much more of an adult, so you know. You can't, you can't have the uh, Jordan Belford, uh, no, Wolf of Wall Street, I, 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 Lamborghini, like where you mm -hmm. take like, some horse No, I don't, don't wanna be like Wall Street. I really like, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna be focusing on deploying this money to make the world a better place, and so yeah. it's, I, I call it an impact fund, although it's not an impact fund in the historical sense of the term. Yeah, I tell people, you know, I always say there's three types of businesses out there. Level one, which is people are making money, but they're exploiting others. It's the yeah. worst. Level two is companies are making money and it's neutral, like yeah. a hotel or something. Yeah. The world's not really worse off or better off from a hotel. And then there's level three businesses where you're making money yeah. and you're changing the world positively. And if you can, at best, try not to have any level one. Yeah. Once in a while, you'll be in a level two, but if you can hit that level three business. Well, hey, you, you, you're talking about a basic biology here. Now, I failed bio, so I may be getting this wrong. Right. But level one is parasitic relationships. Yes, where one, one is taking, and they're not, and they're not giving. Then they're, I forget what the one in the middle is, and then they're symbiotic, yes. where everyone wins. And I only go for symbiotic relationships. I really only try to invest in symbiotic technology. Yes. E even Ripple, which helps banks, actually makes banks more transparent and honest which and, is a, which is a yeah. social good yeah all right let's see somebody said somebody give me one quarter of a bitcoin oh man I've, I've got i've got this thing on my snapchat now i, I call it hashtag dms to jeremy and it's on my twitter it's on my instagram it's on my facebook people just asking for money in the craziest yeah. ways yeah one of the things you guys everybody have to learn me and you i think are similar we didn't we weren't born into money and um one of the things you'll have to learn, if you, for example, like Jeremy's made millions in cryptocurrency, we're not even gonna say how much, but he's made more than a dollar. Uh, and when you don't come from money, same with me, all of a sudden you have to learn how to negoc like, negotiate the world differently because people are like, hey, because everybody goes, well, why can't you just give me 25 grand? And you're like, if I gave it to everybody, you know, I'd give away a hundred million bucks and, and God knows where it would go. So. I got given some advice when I was younger. It's like every loan you'll give is charity. And, yes. and personal loans yes. don't exist. Do not expect to get paid back. And after learning, getting taught that lesson and making some money, I made a few loans to my friends and guess what? I've never, never Oh yeah, I, I gave a guy, first time I had money, I gave an old friend $42,000 to redo his house, flip it, and he was gonna split the profit with me. No. I've made exactly zero, zero cents dollars. back. I wrote that off a long yep. time. Somebody just wrote, uh, uh, Twitter always has the, kind of the best and the worst people. So here is a, here is a skeptic. <laughs> he said, but are you talking to you, Jeremy? Are you just a paper millionaire because you haven't necessarily sold? So it's not paper, it's liquid. I can spend my crypto. I can literally call an OTC desk right now and yes. send, sell millions of dollars. Worth but of do you like to, do you make it a practice as part of your investment overall strategy? to move some of the profits into fiat currencies, no, US dollars. No, I'm really irresponsible. So like I do, I do it. You said uh, you're really uh, irresponsible. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean enough, so I'm just so bullish on this thesis. If, if crypto goes down 90 cents, uh, 90, 90%, I'm totally fine. Right. And so I just need enough money to live, to pay my rent, my rent's super cheap. Like I don't I don't have many expenses in my life. So no, I, I, I'm in the asset class I think will perform the best. Although I also, the one place where I do cash out of crypto is I invest in startups a lot. I'm an angel. Investor. Yeah. So, uh, so I actively invest in uh, startups that won't necessarily take Bitcoin, although I, I've been getting them too sometimes, and, uh, and, and I'll cash out for that. But for the most part, you know, I, I, I have enough money in the bank to pay my credit card bills, to have a fun life, but uh, you know, 95% of my wealth is almost so you're a true time. user of blockchain well the, the real thing is is i can take out maybe 10 15 percent but if you have a rally like you've had but this yeah. year it just goes way back up again yeah it ends up becoming so much of your portfolio because this asset class is appreciating so quickly yeah so somebody asked is it too late is it too late to buy it 
you know. No, it's, 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 it's the same bubble story. It's like if you take a longitudinal view, look long term and say, this technology, and this is why you have to learn about this technology before you invest in it. This technology is going to change our conception of how value is exchanged and how. And if you, if you come to that conclusion, which I have, and many people have, it's why the, the, the value has gone up so much. It doesn't matter if crypto goes down, if Bitcoin goes down 90% in the, in the next few weeks, months, years, because in the long term, it will, it will be worth so much more. Yeah. So you just, you never invest in this more than you're willing to lose. I am masochistic financially and will, willing to lose a lot of money, uh, but, but, it, but you shouldn't, as long as you're not willing to lose the money you invest, just put it into crypto and hold it. Don't even trade. Just hold the cryptos that you really like. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I am not a trader. I invest in uh, cryptos that I really You're like. You're more of a value investor. Yeah, exactly. You're more like the, there's two schools, you know, there's the George Soros school where he's doing arbitraging mm -hmm. and he's made a billion dollars in a day in the conventional Forex markets, currency markets. And then you got the Warren Buffett who's like a buy and hold. It's trading versus investing. And they're, you're more of a they're, value investor, and, not a trader. And to 95% of you out there, you're investors too. Yes. Trading is a skill set and yes. it's almost entirely at this point algorithmic. If you're not using machine learning and artificial intelligence and you're trading sentiment analysis on social media and in chat groups, you're gonna get burnt at some point. You yeah. can trade for a while and then you're gonna make a bad trade. Algorithmic trading is almost the only way to be a trader. Uh, you should only be investing on long-term value unless you're gonna dedicate your life so to So you're seeing some people doing algorithm trading doing very oh, well? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, fine, but not as well as I did because right. at the end of the day, I held let's say ether from 90 cents to yeah, you West, got in for to, those of you who want to hear an amazing thing he got into ethereum <laughs> after the ico months at after 90 launch. cents you yeah, said that was, it was what is it at today it's, a, it's, it's 700 and something 700 dollars. But, so just but, to put but, that but, in perspective you know, for months ethereum was live and trading and it just wasn't being valued but i was having conversations i was building companies on top of this technology and i realized if this technology is successful it's going to be worth way more the way you put in every 15 grand would make, you would have been, you're a millionaire. Oh, well, if you put in a thousand dollars, you'd be a millionaire. thousand dollars, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I have friends, I, I had friends I told to buy Ether. I don't give trading advice anymore, but I did, I did it with that one. And I told my friends to buy Ether. Bitcoin was at 300, I told them to buy into Bitcoin too. And you know, I had, my friends have bought a thousand dollars worth of Ether. The, those that didn't trade made, yeah. made, made over. Uh, it's one thing to buy low, but to keep it. That's what some really people are. sold when it got to. I mean, a lot of people were selling. And there's when nothing it hit and good on you. If you yeah. have a mortgage to pay, you have debt to pay off. You have a children's tuition. Like that should be your focus. But if you're like a 25 year old like me, just hold. Yeah. Just like just hold. Unless something goes wrong with the technology, just hold it. And that's what, how you will realize all the value. A lot of people asking about IOTA. Oof. Let's go. So, give so it to us. I, give, gonna, give us the real I, deal. So I'm going to be honest. So I said 11, 11, over $11 billion worth of, of startups has come out of my nonprofit. To be honest, $10 billion is because one of the co-founders of IOTA was part of my nonprofit, Dom okay. Schneider. Uh, really smart kid. I, I got offered, I'm pretty sure, to invest at a half million dollar valuation. <laughs> and What's now, that IOTA? It's at like $10 billion. Uh, uh, you missed that one. That was, Everybody that was misses miss. some. And yes, don't knock yourself over misses. It happens to the best of us. Um, I started getting asked about IOTA a ton recently, it, it, partially due to the run-up, I believe. Uh, and I started asking my cryptographer, computer science friends, because once I start doing a deep dive on a new crypto, I don't have the technical chops to really know whether it's good or not. And so I started asking people, and it, I heard red flags from everyone. Okay. Everyone sent me red flags. They said, what this, type of red flags? So, so the big one was this happened a while ago. The cryptography is all open source. So, Bitcoin's cryptography, Litecoin, uh, they use SHA 256, SHA 3, different hashing algorithms. These guys tried to roll their own cryptography for yes. IOTA, which is uh, something that's totally unconventional. You don't do in crypto. It's something that should be totally peer reviewed. It's very academic, usually comes out of MIT. Uh, and these guys try to create their own cryptographic algorithm for securing the IOTA network, their Tangle network, I believe. And apparently there were some massive flaws in this. And it showed a level of arrogance and immaturity in the team that really alarmed a lot of people. And you know, I mean, Dom, the, the student I have, who I really adore, you know, I think he's 20, yeah. 21. And you know, 
Look, Iota is... We got 20-year-olds in this game being worth yeah, I mean, Vitalik, million plus. Yeah, I mean, Vitalik, the creator of Ethereum, yeah. was 19 when he invented it. So, and Joey, my co-founder, was 18 when we dropped out of school together. So, you know, it actually, is not, he had just turned 19. But, but the reality is, is that, you know, this technology can be very nascent. I think IOTA is overvalued. I think a lot of these cryptos are overvalued. But I'm not really investing in cryptos right now that are... So for someone, li- I see people asking, "What is IOTA?" We got a lot of people. So, on. so, so they're they are a blockchain, and I may be wrong. I don't know them that well. I've only recently educated myself a bit about them, but it's pretty much a, a blockchain for IoT and supply chains, the Internet mm-hmm. of Things, and it's a very ambitious project. They use a very different sort of technology than what other blockchains do that should make it more scalable and much mm-hmm. cheaper to, to you say scalable that, uh, it's faster fa- it grows it can take it can handle many more transactions on the network as it gets bigger where uh, not bitcoin has kind of yeah it has it has a huge scalability issues yeah. but so it, it's interesting i i would be i would be skeptical about any sort of blockchain that hasn't realized or demonstrated clear value that's worth over a billion dollars. I think XRP, Ethereum, Bitcoin actually have demonstrated very clear va- value that makes them worth so much. But any, any blockchain technology, any crypto token that's valued above a billion dollars, you don't see real, any real world deployments on top of it. Like even CryptoKitties on top of Ethereum is a great yes. use case. It shows that there's a demand for yes. a digital scarcity online. And, e- and it seems that Ether has proved itself as something it's getting that's there. the smart contract side of things. Oh yeah, I mean... It, I, most ICOs are launching on it. It's being used. It's, it's got very strong use cases. Um, so, you know, just be, be hesitant. I, 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 I don't give trading advice, but I don't own IOTA. I, I'd like to see them develop further, hear some good reviews from uh, computer scientists, and then I yeah. don't. So let's do a speed round here because people are asking. They, there's a lot of coins out there. There's literally a thousand plus besides the one you heard about. <laughs> Neo thoughts. Uh, it, in it, a it, it, it is vaporware. You know, if, if you're interested in a blockchain technology team out of East Asia, check out Qtum. Quantum. Um, I was. You the, like that more? I, I, well, I, I'm very biased. I, I, I was uh, uh, the only American angel in their pre-sale, and now they're worth over a billion dollars. And Neo, to explain what Neo is. Ne- Neo tends to be the Chinese Ethereum, pretty yes. much. Whereas Quantum actually has some real technological innovation. They take the Ethereum virtual machine. They pair it with the Bitcoin UTXO transaction style, and they use proof of stake for consensus. It, it, it's, it's a cool technology. The team is incredibly strong. So they're based where? They're, all, so they, they're based primarily in Shanghai, but I think moving more towards Singapore, and also have an office in Denver. But just look at the GitHub code repositories of NEO versus Quantum, and you'll see why, why Quantum is a much better bet if you have an East Asia thesis, which I do. And by the way, if we're losing some of you, the whole point of this show and this live call and what I'm doing is I want to to get people in a place to number one understand this stuff's probably not going to be stopped. Bill Gates has said, "Hey, we're not stopping." It's it. a even, tour de force. Even, even uh, who was it? Janet Yellen, the the, the big you know no, U.S. Fed Federal Reserve. She said, "Look, this is outside of our you know." She's not a big believer, but she's like, "This stuff is its own world that's being developed." This is kind of like the internet in the late 1990s. Get with the program or be left behind. You know, Even Microsoft and Bill Gates got left behind. They didn't catch this. So if you feel a little bit like, oh, I'm lost here, that's good. Yeah. You wanna be, I always am trying to get myself around people or in rooms where I feel lost because- Always be the dumbest person yeah, in the It's room. like lifting weights. If you're the strongest person, if you're your own personal trainer, you're not gonna be as strong as if you have somebody stronger than you pushing you for the next rep. So this is mental reps, trying to get you guys smarter. So let's talk about, uh, somebody talk about Steam. Steam's interesting. Uh, they use, they're one of those first strong use cases for proof of stake, mm-hmm. which doesn't re- require mining like in the Bitcoin network, which yes. is less, much less en- en- energy intensive. It's interesting. I don't like these social network plays really. So just so you guys know, Steam is kind of like a Reddit. Yeah, a decentralized crypto Reddit. blockchain Reddit. I'm just not bullish on that. I think information is meant to be free. I don't think people are going to want to pay f- 
for information, I, you know, I think... Although net neutrality, we should talk about well, that. Well, so, so that... What do you really think about The uh, net neutrality just came out today. It was crazy. Getting repealed. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Good or bad? Is it as big a deal as you think people are making of it? So, so I've got like world? super liberal progressive parents in, in Western Massachusetts. And they're freaking out. They're like, the internet is over. It's like, you guys weren't even on the internet until after me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, let it be over because the blockchain, if you talk to like Brock, your partner at Blockchain yeah. Capital, you know, he says the internet is an intermediary step. Like mm -hmm. we had like TV and conventional kind of communication, phones, modems, faxes, and then the internet was stage two. And he says the blockchain will replace everything. Yeah, I think it will underlie almost all value exchange yes. in the world. Uh, but, but even but, thinks websites, right. be, like Steam is an example yes. of this. So, so, so what's really, the only upside I see to net neutrality is that it will be a catalyst for innovation in this yes. web 3.0. People, it'll speed up blockchain. More, more people working in the internet industry, especially at the infrastructural level, will be like, well, there's not much we can do with what we have now, let's move to blockchain technology. That, yeah. that, that's, that's an upside, but I mean, I'm very upset about what happened. Somebody talked about Salt. I'm gonna have the fa one of the co-founders of Salt here on the show. He's trying to jump in here, um, but that's a whole, you know, salt, what do you think salt has a use case? For someone like me, if, yes. if you have large gains in crypto and you want to uh, not Get some cash, cash out, without yeah, yeah, liquidity. You, you, give them, you, give, you loan them your crypto and they, or they loan you cash. Yes. And if the price of crypto goes up, yes. they, they, give you, you, they give you the full value of your crypto. But if it goes down, then you have to pay more. Yeah. So it's dangerous. It's a little bit it's, it's, like it's margin just, delivery. Yeah. Not really margin. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a fairly a risky financial instrument. If you made enough money in crypto, it makes sense to use. I don't know what the tax impl implications are. I have some people say that it can help you avoid yeah, you uh, triggering your gains events. Yeah, because loans, I mean, look, Apple, this is what Apple does. If you guys, because I'll give you a, some, you've been giving me a lot of amazing mentorship in the world of, of crypto, I'll, I'll, and you know a lot about business, but in the business world, a company like Apple sets up offshore in a country like Ireland where taxes is 10%. They are keeping, I think, over 100 billion. Yeah, hordes and of money. And what they do, they do not repatriate to the US where they'll have to pay taxes. They go to a bank in the US, they say, we got 100 billion in Ireland or more Give us a hundred billion. We'll secure it dollar for dollar with our Irish money. We'll put it in escrow so that that money's locked. And so then banks in, in go, okay, well, you got a hundred billion you can secure with in Ireland. Well, here's a hundred billion dollars as a loan. Loans not only are not income, so you don't have to pay any, 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 any tax on it, but then the interest they pay is tax deductible. So something like salt theoretically could have that potential argument to the yeah. IRS that, hey, you want your money. Now, if you only are making 100 bucks in, in crypto, you're probably not gonna use salt. No, They're it's not for, gonna it's, loan you it's $30. For, it's for people that are cash poor like me yeah. and, may, and don't wanna sell their crypto. So let's talk about the, you know, the chains. So you have Bitcoin and you have ETH. And yeah. let's talk about something like EOS, which is, you know, blockchain capital, you being a partner, Brock Pierce, yeah, EOS is going to be involved with what do you my think, uh, what, what It's going to be involved in your yeah. fund. What do you think is this thing going to replace the other you know, chains like ETH or is it going to just be a, used for other things like Visa, tran right. like quote unquote Visa? So uh, you asked me at the right time because Brock being a, one of my closest business partners, he went and co-founded EOS. And I'm I was drinking like, your water by the way. Uh, that's fine. Sorry. I, like, I have no issue with terms. <laughs> he... he, he was a co-founder of this technology and I was super skeptical. I was like this delegated proof of stake thing where only there are 21 validators in the network uh, and uh, validating transactions instead of thousands like in Ethereum or Bitcoin. And I, I was just very skeptical of the technology and I'm close friends with most of the founding team and I spend a lot of time with them and they kept on trying to pitch me and I just wasn't convinced. And then one day I had this realization about EOS and it was this, it was that, look at Bitcoin. Right now they're 
most, while there are thousands of miners around the world, they're all consolidated into five mining pools. North and Korea so, is a big one, by the yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> and, so, and so it's actually not that decentralized, but it's censorship resistant. It's, it's that you, can break, you can't like just go and attack yes. all the miners at once. Uh, Ethereum's the same way, except that it only has three major mining pools. However, once again, because the miners are all around the world, yes. you, there's no the way- The US government yeah, can't, can't just crack down can't on You can't take all. them out. Now, EOS, with 21 validators, in theory is actually more decentralized than Ethereum or Bitcoin, but it's less censorship resistant. Yes. Because at the end of the day, if a, if a large federal agency out of the United States or another major government, or some like super villain organization like Scepter or something decides to go take all those people hostage, then all of a sudden, you, the 21 people is not censorship, censorship yes. resistant. That being said, I'd say less than 70% of all applications that I think are really valid on, to be built on top of blockchains actually require censorship resistance. So money, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. uh, that requires censorship resistance. You want no, nobody to be able to exert influence over money. Uh, Augur, which is decentralized betting, prediction making. That that's something that's going to piss off a lot of governments and large financial. That's that's by the way his one of yeah. his and, startups. And so that needs to be on top of Ethereum. Um, and, and there will be a handful. Augur's built on, on top of Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and so th there are will be a handful of applications that need high levels of censorship resistance. But I'd say anything in supply chain, enterprise level applications, government level applications of blockchain technology. EOS is actually a really strong use case because it. it, it Where do you it, see it being used? What's the practical? Like standard? supply chains, okay. supply chains, digital identity, uh, th things like um, what else is a good? Uh, any sort of governance application. It's very fast too. Yes, it's super fast and it's super scalable. So it can hold a, a payment networks. I mean, yeah, that's what I say. Like, you know, the big thing that people argue the critics is. Well, people still using their Visa card. This is, you know, if you look at how you spend money now, especially in the United States and most Western countries, it's going on cards. Right. And Bitcoin it probably can't handle that, right. right? If all of a sudden everybody was doing their credit card transaction on Bitcoin Never. network, so, so it's Bitcoin, gonna explode. The Bitcoin network can handle up to about seven transactions a second. Yeah. The Visa network can handle up to 6,000. Yeah. But and the what, EOS, EOS is at, they claim what? over tens of thousands. Yeah, faster than the Visa network. And, and, there, and this is also one of the reasons why you can't do micropayments with Visa. Unless you're, yes. uh, unless you're uh, like iTunes and Apple, you, very few vendors can get payment relationships where they can accept less than $100 uh, or a dollar for, per transaction. Yeah, because there's too much cost so, to it. So, so if you're talking about content sharing and content creating. Yes, like you something need, like Steam. Yeah, you, you actually need a much more scalable infrastructure for payments than even Visa has. Bitcoin is not that solution. So do you think something like Steam in the future would be built on EOS? Yeah, I mean, it's the same, the same founder. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, uh, Dan Larimer created yeah. both. Uh, so, but so faster than Ethereum? Yes, but less censorship resistant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but Ethereum will uh, go to proof of stake, but proof of stake still won't be as fast as delegated proof of stake, which is what EOS has. Yeah, delegate, so proof of stake, Basically, Bitcoin is not proof of stake. No, it's proof of work. So and it's proof of slow. work. Proof of work. <laughs> That's require, why you have miners. Yeah. So it requires all these like supercomputers all around the world. Proof of stake is less computationally intensive. Anybody that owns uh, ether, for example, could stake their ether, which allows for the validation of transactions. But still, every staker in the network still has to validate a transaction, which means thousands of computers have to uh, validate every single transaction transaction in the network. And that's just not scalable. So let's talk about this. I want to. I want to go through. You good to keep talking? I can talk for days. <laughs> I, I'm literally in interview mode, man. I mean, that's good. It, I, you guys are getting lucky. <laughs> Jeremy Gardner, for those of you coming in late, he is. Uh, this is gonna need. Uh, no, no, no. It's gonna need a charge. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Jeremy Gardner. He is 25 years old. He's made millions, and he's being conservative here on the show. Uh, he's made a ton of money. Uh, with crypto, he w has been in it, got into the ether under a dollar. He's a partner, and now he's switching to his own fund, but in blockchain capital, which is really the most, the biggest and most well known. First guys to invest in blockchain yeah, technology. Blockchain technology with Brock Pierce, who was also on my show. Um, 
you guys are watching the live version. For those of you listening later, we'll have it on YouTube and Facebook and on my new block, uh, blockchain podcast. It's the Ty Lopez Bitcoin. It's already, I don't know if you saw it, shot to number 10 in the world of all podcasts. Oh, I'm sure. And now Everyone number, wants to learn about Bitcoin. Yeah, it's number two in business uh, last I checked today. So make sure you subscribe to that because this is stuff you are learning from the smartest people in the world. And the whole idea here is I'm a relative newbie to the world of crypto. I mean, I've been watching it for a while, um, but I've been around the game of money for a, for quite a long time, over a decade. And whenever I want to learn something, I believe in mentors. So I go out and find people, you know? And so today's mentor that's being shared with you is Jeremy, and he built Augur, so which is a couple hundred million dollar market cap on the company, a prediction kind of betting tool built on the blockchain. And um, we've had, you know, Brock Pierce, we had William on, one of the top traders. He built the, the trading desk for uh, science, the crypto trading desk. And if you want to learn even You know, I managed Will as a DJ when, when he was in college. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we went to college <laughs> together. Yeah, and I was his manager. That's funny. <laughs> um, and so, for those of you who want to go a little more in-depth than we can even go on the show, because we're not going to go for days and days, I've got a 60-day program you go to tylopez.com slash bitcoin podcast and it'll take you and you can enter it's a paid program tylo isn't that the url tylopez.com slash bitcoin podcast yeah, right. so let's talk about exchanges and wallets this is a big thing and i think one of the things i was reading an article or, or a note it was either i think it was from either vitalik or or uh vinnie lingam or one of these guys and they were talking about one of the problems now why banks kind of more money is in the conventional banking world. It's very simple. Whereas wallets are complicated for people and people are having to learn these new things like private keys and oh my gosh, I store it you know, in cold storage and hot wallet. It's like very confusing for people. To be your own bank, which you're allowed to kind of do with crypto is scary to people. Mm -hmm. So what do you think for people new in the game, let's talk about your initial purchase of some of this cryptocurrency, whether it be the big ones, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, or the alternative coins. You know, we've talked about Stellar and we've talked about, uh, we talked about Ripple and stuff. Where do you recommend uh, people start buying? Do they buy? Coinbase is the biggest. Yeah. What others do you like? Uh, if you're in the US, Coinbase is really your best option. I mean, unless you're comfortable with a traditional financial exchange and that, that, that trading interface, you know, Coinbase has its GDAX, which yeah, is GDAX. like that. Uh, I, I, Kraken, I think you can buy it from now, and there's Gemini yes. out of New York. That, that's Those three you like the best. Well, no. So those are good for exchange interfaces. Yes. If you just want a simple buy sell interface, Coinbase is the best. Circle used to be great, but they, they shut down that business a while ago. I'm sure they're regretting it now. Uh, I, I don't even know. I mean, I mean, Coinbase, now let's talk about to buy altcoins because Coinbase, you're not necessarily buying, yeah. you know, Ripple. You're not buying Stellar. Like, yeah. you're not buying Cents. You're not buying, Correct. you know. So, where do you recommend people buy for the alternatives? So. I, first of all, don't keep your money on the exchange if you're comfortable securing it yourself. There's a massive amount of exchange risk. These, these, these exchanges get hacked and Bitcoin is like, crypto is like cash. It's not like a stock. It's not like a wire. It's not like a credit card charge. Like once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah, if you lose and, your cash, well, yeah, <laughs> like if you leave 10,000, if you have a, my true story, my dad came once in my life. I didn't grow up with my dad, but once in my life when I made it, started making a little bit of money, I sent him a ticket. I said, let's go on a trip to Puerto Rico. Only trick, uh, trip I ever did in my life with my dad. So we get, to, he flies in, meets me in Puerto Rico, and he's having a heart attack. He's not literally, but he's like, Ty, this is the worst day of my life. I want to go back to LA. I'm like, dad, what happened? He's like, I, so my dad had, my dad was unbanked. One of the things that crypto is going to help with is the unbanked. My dad was born in Harlem, you know, not to wealthy family. His dad was worked in the mechanic in the subway system. You know, Harlem is not a rich place. My dad never had a bank account in his life to this day. He's never had a credit card. He doesn't trust it. You know, my dad went to prison, so he, he doesn't love the system. And so he go, he kept in cash. So we're in Puerto Rico and he goes, I had $3,000 in my sock. And my sock is not in my luggage anymore. You lose it, you lose 3,000 bucks. You can't walk up to somebody, even if you saw them steal the cash from you, 
unless you have proof, a uh, video of them taking it, they are just like, no, oh, you, I already you, had three grand. You're going to have to pickle. snuff them. You're going you're, you're to have <laughs> to Don't snuff them. them, but that's what, <laughs> that we know how Jeremy thinks. He may murder you if you steal the money. But, uh, don't steal my money. <laughs> yeah, don't steal your money or he has Pablo Escobar's cousin coming for you. Um, so let's talk. So if you lose, if you put money on exchange and the exchange folds, like what's the one you were talking about earlier? That, that folded the exchange? Uh, circle. And they, they, yeah, they no, no, folded. not circle. You're talking about earlier, the big one that got Mount Gox. Yeah. So there's, there's precedent for these things disappearing. So if you're going to take your money, so Gemini, cracking, Coinbase, if you're taking your money off, okay, what do you like? Cold storage is really good. I mean, so I like Coinbase because they're insured. Yes. So like, uh, unless you're responsible, which you probably will be if, they're, if you get hacked, uh, but if, if they get hacked, all their money is insured up to every single coin that they hold. Does it have a limit though on FDIC? No, it's, it's a broader insurance than that. It's okay, like they, so don't have FDIC. they don't have FDIC. So insurance. keeping it in Coinbase is it's fine. If, if you're going to keep it on If you state. have good security and don't have your phone number yes. used as a recovery what option. Do you, do you use a, like a Google Auth? Yeah, so use Google Auth and then... The That's an app you download called Google Authenticator. It's on your phone. It continually changes numbers. When you go to log in, that way if somebody stole your password, they would need your phone. Yes. So don't let your phone be stolen, by the way. Yeah, and it's same, of, same with your email addresses. They should not have a recovery number uh, that, that, that's associated with your public phone number. Get a Google Voice number or something. Yeah, get a, get, because yeah, if, they, if you use your main phone number and that thing goes down, I mean, if somebody, there's been instances where people have called in, This happened, swapped, no, this has this happened to happened. every single person I worked with. I'm the, really? only, I'm the only one of my close colleagues I know. So is that, that using a Google hacked. number? Was that a trick? No, so what, well, yes, so that's why they didn't get me. Uh, it, it was, they couldn't transfer yeah, Because I did, my phone number wasn't associated with any of my online accounts. So that was really big. But if you want to secure, secure your crypto, uh, hardware wallets are a great place to start. Trezor, yeah. uh, uh, I just got my Ledger Nano Blue, which is like a little iPad yep. uh, where you can see all your cryptos on. You believe in a dedicated laptop? One I of my should. One I of should. my trader buddies, he's like, yeah. dude, I got a laptop. I don't use for anything yeah, else. Yeah, I should. I, I should 100% have my own laptop, like a little Chromebook. It's fine. It yep. costs 200 bucks, you know, yep. 150 bucks off Amazon. Uh, and you should probably do all your trading on that. You should and use strap, a VPN. And tape it to your body. <laughs> Sleep with it. Hey, wear uh, an explosive vest so if anyone tries to take yeah. it, at least you're going with it. <laughs> it's real simple to do. You just walk around with stuff strapped No, to no, no, body. but hard, hardware storage is a really good place to go. Uh, but. Really, any uninsured exchange is a bad place. But if you want to buy alts, you know, there's Poloniex, yes. there's Kraken, uh, there's Bitterex, there's Binance, which my friends have been r raging about. I, I haven't used it yet. Poloniex, uh, Bitterex is kind of the biggest. Yeah, those are the big ones. But Binance uh, is bas based out in South Korea. Well, I, who knows? Because South Korea just like kind of banned Bitcoin banking uh, federal, uh, illegally. These so. government. Let's talk about this for a second. Are governments going to have... A literal, like I, I could see this coming to a place, like right now it's not big enough that it's threatening fiat currency. It's not quite there yet. Right. Uh, it's small. Well, in some countries, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, it does, 100%. Yes, but Zimbabwe yeah, is in chaos. Yeah. They, they, well, it's so, not, is, so is Venezuela. Yes, yeah, so Venezuela, but it's still, Venezuela is even this massive yeah. dictatorship. But Venezuela's kind of embraced it with their own coin, Petro coin. Oh, that's something. crazy. I, who knows what that God, is. God, I don't recommend <laughs> buying anything put together by don't the buy, Venezuelan no, Don't buy, government. yeah, like a government issue. It's called a dictator coin. Yeah. Who wants this Joseph Stalin coin? <laughs> Um, so, do you think there comes a time when the U.S. government, this happened in Russia, this happened in China, this happened in Korea, um, do you think there is a time where the U.S. government goes, hell no, and they'll say that it's a threat to the stability, stability of the U.S. finance system and the global economy, so they're going to have reasons to come in. What's your worry there, if any? So four years ago when I got into this industry, that was the number one existential threat to crypto. Yes. And then since then, it's actually much more become internal strife, uh, especially within Bitcoin. Uh, but now we're moving forward to today, after having suffered so many hacks, so much bad PR, so many bad things have happened in crypto, I'm now actually convinced once again that they're probably the largest real long-term threat to crypto assets are probably state actors, primarily the United States. 
That being said, <laughs> I usually I, you don't hear it that way. Usually, state actors is like bad actors. No, like, it's really just the United States, and I, I'm I'm pretty sure that's not a real threat. We've done such an incredible job as an industry going and being proactive with legislators, with regulators. We have our own caucus in Congress, the Blockchain Caucus. I, I met with many of those senators and House representatives, and they get it. And there, there aren't really any true enemies of crypto. Now, what I think will happen is that eventually, just like what's happening in China and Russia, where they're creating their state-issued uh, distributed ledger-based crypto currencies, but that will be stable uh, and obviously issued by the government, I think we'll probably see that in the U.S. Janet Yellen yes. said that they had... That, that was yesterday or a couple days ago. Well, yeah, a little while ago, Janet Yellen repeatedly actually said that the government had to explore a blockchain or distributed ledger-based uh, dollar. But that's much, much different than a cryptocurrency. Yeah. Cryptocurrencies are totally bub public, auditable, usually they're floating. Uh, these are state issued and are actually much scarier than the currencies that we have today because they are, uh, they're like big brother coins. Yes. Because you know with the, uh, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, you have a publicly auditable history of every single uh, transaction that's ever occurred. But with uh, US backed cryptocurrency, they know who's making every transaction, what you're transacting, a level of detail that is not currently available in, in conventional crypto. Just remember this. If you could go back in history, a time machine, year by year back, and listen to the predictions that were made each year, predictions are somewhat of a fool's game. And when you meet people, this is why it kind of pisses me off. Uh, what was the big banker, Jamie? Uh, Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon. These people making these definitive claims are just idiots. Yeah, now he's probably not an idiot. He probably has some. Jamie Dimon's very smart. Yeah, he but he has some underlying. He's protecting his own interests. Yeah, but that's still bullshit. Yeah, I, don't I mean, like but, but, but look, look, he, he's got these he, has a public, he has a publicly traded company. He has to maintain shareholder value. Yeah, but just and, shut and, up and, about and, it. If you like, don't lie. <laughs> don't be yeah, like, oh. I mean, but you look at and most, he's backtracked. Yeah, he's yeah. like, oh, baby. He goes uh, back and forth. Uh, you know, don't don't listen to bankers and their opinion on Bitcoin unless they like it, and then you can listen. to them. No, no, but don't listen. Hey, this is one thing I like Charlie Munger, a business partner of Warren Buffett, billionaires. They said, beware of extreme ideologies. When you meet people who say, a Bitcoin will be at one million tomorrow by today, they're probably wrong. It's too extreme of an ideology. When you meet people who say, oh, Bitcoin will crash and this is the next tulip mania, which people don't know what tulip mania. First of all, tulip mania in the 1700s, tulips had very little utility. It wasn't storable. It didn't have finite um, number of circulation like Bitcoin. It's not a good analogy. No. So if you, why nothing, be at the extreme? Nothing. Why not be in the middle? That's how intelligent people talk. Yeah, know what you don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I don't even claim to be an expert on this stuff. There is no expert. You know one of my biggest things that pisses me off? Like now I, I'm posting a little more on my Twitter and stuff. And I have a pretty big Twitter following. So I get to have every weirdo in the world reply. And people are like... Ah, Ty, you're new to this. I've been, and I'm like, how fucking long have you been in it? <laughs> Two years. Since 2016. <laughs> Whoa, oh, you are a fucking OG of money. You just because the shit's gone up in the one year, you didn't have shit to do with it. Did you build the fucking blockchain technologies that is going? No. You read three blog posts, two Reddits, and one Steam article, and you are now the expert and mad at me for coming in. And one guy admitted, at least he was intellectually honest, he's like, well, I'm kind of salty because I was in it before you. And I'm like, this is not some hipster bullshit where, you know, the hipster stereotype no, is like, we everyone. I heard of this band no, first. Well, fuck it, you. I heard of it second. Two is bigger well, than one. Well, well, well two, it's, no, it's Metcalf's law. It, it, it's the power of the network is greater with every additional yes, participant. you want the network. more you participants. Want more people. The more people that buy, the, the higher the price goes. Yeah. And the more we win because... But people it, are too stupid to it, think it, that. It's oh not a God. competition. This is not... A, uh, this is not a and the whole technology jazz. is decentralizing money. To well, decentralize money, you need... The world decentralized doesn't mean 17 people in their basement know about it. And just because you know the name of this, I'm going to start challenging everybody who's a hater and says they're an expert. I'm going to be like, okay, show me lines of code you're writing on a blockchain technology. And if you really are writing code and you are like a foundational fundamental person in this world 
then you are a true expert. But I push back. But those people I'll, are too. I'll, well, I'll push back because you're probably an expert in one blockchain. You probably know Bitcoin right. really well. You don't know Ethereum. Yes. You don't know anything about XRP. You don't know anything about uh, uh, any Tezos and Filecoin. Like, you can only focus on one thing, and thus, none of us are experts. We're all constantly learning. The whole point is we're trying to not have centralized experts. That's like the, the, the banking system. You shouldn't system. rely on experts. I mean, that's yeah. the whole idea of uh, Augur. It's instead of relying on one person, uh, you have thousands of people putting it's their money. It's crowdsourced yeah, yeah, decision making. Yeah, you have thousands Collaborative of intelligence is the technical word People putting it. their money where their mouth is. I, I hate talking heads because they're never put, willing to put money down on what they're saying. It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. You have to put your money Think down. Think about sports. You get these people, like I, I like basketball, and you get these people like, oh, Lonzo Ball's a bust, or Brandon Ingram and the Lakers a bust. I'm like, and then when they're not a bust, take Brandon and Ingram. All of a sudden, those same talking heads are like, I love Brandon Ingram. I'm like, dude, it's not how the game goes. Predictions are for fools. You can only play statistical odds. You can say, for example, when I look at Lonzo Ball or when I look at Brent Ingram or when I look at LeBron, I'm not seeing the statistics backing up, but who knows, maybe it'll change. That's how intelligent people talk. Like even I was listening to how you talked about, let's say, IOTA or Steam, which you're not necessarily super bullish on, but you're like, look, I don't know a ton about them. For me personally, I'm not buying them. You know what I mean? And that's how smart people talk. So be very careful, especially in this game. Early adopters are often great people and are often weirdos. And oh, so, total freaks. God, I go to some crypto events and I'm like, this will not become widespread if these are the spokespeople because people might be worried that these are axe murderers. Some of them are axe murderers. Like, yeah, and they're not. We're all weird in our own I mean, way. Look, I'm not trying to disparage anybody. Look at anybody. what's happening on Hollywood. There are a lot of predators out there. Freaks. There's good people and bad people everywhere. There's early adopters that are good. My point is, simply being an early adopter doesn't give you some special entitlement to be more no, the, able to talk about this than I would. I, the, the earlier someone got into crypto, the stupider they were because the probability of this shit working out was so low back then. It's, yeah. just, it, it's just like I, I was stupid for go, dropping out of college and going all in. That, I, I went against the odds. Yes. If, I, if, I want, if I wanted to create a statistical analysis of how I'd be successful in life, dropping out of school and creating a crazy right. decentralized application was not the way to do it. But it worked. It, it worked. It so worked. you laugh last. But, 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 but I'm not here like, like making fun of anyone for not being in crypto when I got in. I, I, I made a, a choice because I was so philosophically driven to what I was doing, but it, it was not because I like wanted to be better than anyone else. Yeah. You should never do anything to be better than other people. No, you should. That, that's intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic. You're, you want to be intrinsically motivated. Like there's something you want to do. You're not going, I want to be better than somebody else. But look, we all have our flaws. I got plenty of them. I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm just saying, remember this. This is a game where anybody's going to be able to get in. You're going to have kids. Anybody that gets into crypto now yeah. and puts in a, a fairly diverse portfolio of really strong crypto assets that are generally accepted as not being scammed or being well thought out, they're going to do, you're going to do well. You, yeah. just, you just have to forget about it, put it in, put in some cold storage, throw it in the safe or yes. a bank deposit box, or wherever, wherever you feel it will be secure and just, and just let it sit there. And some of you will become traders. Like, you know, one thing Brock told me is like, look, Brock, you, Brock is the worst trader in the world, yeah, I, I'll tell you. But he says, he says for him, he's a value hold. He, but he said, if you have the skill of trading, yes. this can be traded. If you don't have the skill of trading, don't trade. But if, 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 you, if you don't know quantitative analytics, and you yes. don't know machine learning, once again, I, I, I'd argue that you probably shouldn't trade. Yes. I don't believe in technical analysis. I don't believe that's a real thing. I believe that, you know, what you can do, do you, in a bear market, trading makes sense. When the price of cryptos aren't moving that much, you'll make more money trading. But in a bull market like yes. today, just hold the good technology and it goes up so much, you actually will lose out by trading. Okay, we're gonna do a speed round as we wrap up here. And uh, we're gonna record some stuff for the program. You got a minute after this to record a yeah. lesson or two? Are these people always so angry? Oh, dude, if, <laughs> actually, I will say this has been one of the least, there, people are loving it. This is a great video. The world market's about to crap. People are, talk stratus, thoughts on Ripple. I love you guys. Okay, all right, now we're getting positive. No, dude, you know, mo this is what I've learned. It's very interesting. YouTube Live has the most haters, but the most intelligent people.
Interesting. It's like very divided. So Facebook is more positive in general always. Yes. Instagram is definitely more positive. Yeah. Um, well, they, they do a very good job. They they've done that. Insta, actually, dis- you may have lost. You may have cursed. You lost that. Insta. Did you guys? Did you actually triple check it was charging? It it's may have been charging, charging, but not charging fast. It was plugged no. in. Um, yeah, it's live. It's got right here. Huh? No, trust There's me. There's no display though. Gone. Oh, okay. You can tell. No, it probably just died because it wasn't charging fast enough. As I said, it's dr- it crashed. <laughs> um, Twitter is interesting because Twitter, for sure, has the most kids in their basement. But Twitter... But also has a lot of crypto smart people. If you want to fo- learn about you, crypto in real time, you, the you, best you place to learn... Phone? There's no website, there's no news yeah. website, no forum better than crypto. You just need to follow better the right people. Twitter. Yeah, better than Twitter. Twitter, <laughs> yeah. Twitter or you like Twitter, Steam. Tw- I mean, there's stuff Twitter, on YouTube. Twitter, but Steam is kind of biased. You don't get any right. real Bitcoin people on it. I think but Twitter is just full of brilliant people having really smart conversations in real time. It's where I get most of my crypto news. Uh, it, it, it's a great tool. So let's talk about, I'm going to do a speed run. How come these are not, how come these are dead? No, they were like at yet. 20% when we started. I don't know why it wasn't charging on the road. But I'm saying. They should start at 100 before we start the show. That doesn't make sense to be at 20%. All right, I'm gonna do a speed route. So I'm going on coin market cap. We're just gonna talk about some coins that we haven't talked about because for some people, they're interested in you know Bitcoin, which is kind of gold 2.0, and other people are interested in these other dealios. All right, live. Let's, let's get our Instagram back. Is that a 10 or an 8 plus? 8 plus. Okay, let me do this. I'm gonna give away some cash giveaway while we do this. Let's give away 100 bucks. You can buy a little Bitcoin with this. What is the name of the company that Jeremy started that is a predictive tool, predictive marketing to, uh, analysis tool, kind of like a betting tool using uh, collaborative intelligence? You got a misspelling on the top left. All right, I'm gonna uh, pick yeah. one. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I guess one of the spells are right. Get one of the spells are right. That guy. All right. Armin, are you helping taking pictures? Okay. Which one? I don't care. Tarek said auger. A U G U R. Marco, Ty is actually really intelligent and seeing things before they're really big or even bigger. Cardano, somebody talk. Let's start. Somebody mentioned Cardano. So 100 uh-huh. bucks will be PayPaling. Cardano is a new one. Not I have no Charles Hoskinson, the, mm-hmm. the founder of Cardano. Super smart. Uh, he he's had issues with leading teams before. What is Card What is Cardano Cardano's white paper? I think I think it's is. kind of like a better version of Ethereum, kind of like EOS. So it's a platform people are going to yeah. Build it's on. a new blockchain. Yeah. Uh, but, new I, but I don't know nearly enough about it to talk about it. So I'll leave it at that. All right. I'm pulling up Coin Market Cap. And we're just going to go through. Actually, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap this up. I'm gonna, we're going to be doing a lesson for those of you who are in the program at tylopez.com slash Bitcoin podcast. This is going to be a fascinating lesson. So those of you, we basically have a mastermind. I'm bringing in, trying to share. We just shared an hour and 12 minutes of free information. Um, very powerful stuff. But I want to take a handful of you through a 60-day mentorship uh, that the mentorship I'm going through with these smart guys, these top foundational people like Jeremy, like Brock, all these different teachers like William. And so um, we're going to do a lesson right now for those of you that are already in. If you're not in, go tylopez.com slash Bitcoin podcast. Two words, Bitcoin podcast. And you'll see the page. You'll see how much it costs. You'll see all that stuff. So, um, do you want to say that again here, for instance? No, no, we're done with okay. Insta. So we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna give away. We said an iPad Mini. And the next question is, um, what is the name of the technology or the company that will be that banks are using in Japan that Jeremy was talking about? First person, not Litecoin. We're gonna let them all catch up here. Somebody said Apple. <laughs> Got some of the letters correct, but you don't have all of them. Let's see. Uh, all right, let's pick a winner here on YouTube. Tell me when to. No, we did YouTube last time. Let's do uh, Twitter. Tell me when to stop. Uh, Wait, don't look. Don't look. You got to. Oh. No, no, you can't pick <laughs> like that. Uh, 
Well, so I, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm just choosing based off the pictures. No, don't do that. Tell. Close your eyes. Close your <laughs> eyes. Right, and do it. Now. All right. Ripple, ripple, ripple. We got it. No sickerness, sickness or something. We're sending you this bad boy. It's an iPad Mini 4, 128 gigs. Thank you. If you live too far away to ship it, we'll send you the money. But uh, if you're in the U.S., send or, them the Bitcoin. We'll send you the bit. We'll send it in. Uh, we'll send it in. What should we send it in? Ripple. Ripple. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's trading now. All right. Thank you so much. Make sure you go subscribe to my podcast. That's another thing you want to be. If you just go to iTunes, it's uh, tylopez.com slash Bitcoin show. Subscribe there. It's a top three business show now in the world. And you can listen to more free stuff. If you want to go through the 60-day mentorship, tylopez.com slash Bitcoin podcast. That will redirect you to the exact same place. We're going to record a badass lesson. We're going through, market, uh, we're going through the coinmarketcap.com and we're just talking about other coins and Jeremy's expert opinion. We're going to talk about the ones you're an expert in. We'll skip the ones you're not an expert yeah. in. And you'll be learning a lot because never invest in what you don't understand, period. No matter how much money your friend says you can make, if you want to get in Bitcoin, if you want to get in altcoins, don't invest out of ignorance. Invest out of education and intelligence. And then when the markets move up and down, you'll be able to hold your position and not freak out. When you're just buying because your buddy said or because it was in, you know, it's on some Forbes article that you saw online, you, you don't have enough, you don't know what you're doing enough to hold the line and you make money. He bought ETH at 90 cents and you held the line on it. Yeah. And it's at 700. 700. Do the math on that. That's insane. Basically, every dollar turned into $700. So let's just say, those of you, like Jeremy, if you had put ten thousand dollars in, and you multiply it times seven hundred, you'd have seven million bucks today, assuming you sold. Oh hell! Oh, sold today. Sold today. That's, Don't do that though. Uh, but you can also rebalance. You can, you can rebalance, rebalance some in you cash. Can take, you can put. You can pull in the two cash. mil and keep five million yeah, in coin and go. let the thing go and have yeah. two million and and yeah. and you know one thing that Brock told me he's diversified into real estate too. Yeah. So by that's a hard asset that if crypto falls to crap, he still owns yeah, a crap we, load of Yeah, we've done a few real estate deals. Yeah. Startups, too. Fun. All right. We're headed over. You guys are missing out if you're not at tylopez.com slash Bitcoin podcast. Get in the program. See you in a minute. Okay. Yeah, let's say I want to start with all these at 95%. What happened to these two Instagram posts? The our backup.